I'm going to have uh, Chief Felix Thomas uh, join us up here and introduce the next panel. Uh, as mentioned, Chief uh, Felix is a tribal chief of the Saskatoon Tribal Council and chair of the First Nations Power Authority. And so he is up here ready and raring to go. And I'm going to get him, as our panelists make their way up here, uh, to introduce and he'll be moderating our, our uh, panel this afternoon. So with that, uh, Tribal Chief. Thank you, Gary. Um, good afternoon, uh, once again. Um, for those of you uh, that had um, a light lunch and not napping, <laughs> always happens in the afternoon. Anyways, uh, this afternoon's um, session is uh, the business case for renewables. And this is probably, uh, I'm not, uh, um, not to be, um, bias, but this is probably the, the most important one, because at the end of the day, everything comes down to economics, uh, whether, it's, uh, uh, whether it's your own individual household or a company or a, a government, it all boils down to economics and whether, whether, whether you can make the, uh, the right case for, uh, for investments as opposed to costs. And I think that's for uh, as First Nations and uh, people in the community. Those are some of the things we always face when we, uh, uh, we're trying to convince government or industry that these are investments and, and they're making a case, that, but it's a cost. And so as we move forward, these are some of the things uh, I think that uh, uh, renewables, um, there'll be that debate, uh, not only whether it's investment or whether it's the cost, what's the return, how long, well, is it a public uh, in Saskatchewan, is it a public institution? And in other cases, are they private uh, uh, institutions at uh, utilities? So those are some of the things, and uh, and I know uh, um, for SAS Power, it's almost it's a public it's a public institution that runs like a private institution because they have to uh, meet uh, growing needs or demands or and and in the future. So those are some of the things that uh, we have. Our speakers are going to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, the first one is uh, down at the end, Ran Narayama, Narayana Sami. And uh, the guys at uh, First, Power, First Nation Power Authority, everybody knows, knows them as Ran from SAS Power. That's <laughs> <laughs> just a lot, it's a lot easier. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and Ran is, he's a senior business advisor for SAS Power. Uh, he began working at, with SAS Power in 2005 and has served a number of different areas, uh, transmission and distribution and Greenfield Hydro. Um, in 2015, was Brand was uh, appointed to work on the Aboriginal procurement strategy, focusing on increased Aboriginal participation in SAS Power's procurement and supply chain opportunities. And uh, he was a Bachelor of, Edu uh, Bachelor of Engineering degree from the University of Madras, India, Masters of Engineering, Masters of Business Admin, from the U of R, a master's certificate in project manage management from York University, and a registered professional engineer. Clay Cop Copeland is a CEO of Cordova Electric uh, Corp Cooperative in Alaska. He holds a bachelor of degree in electrical engineering from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and an MBA from Indiana University School Kelly School of Business. He's the mayor of Cordova and served on many boards, including the Alaska Center for Energy and Power Advisory Board. His professional specialties include underground electric, communication line de design, and project management, electrical, electric utility business management, and strategic planning and execution. Not that kind of execution, I think, <laughs> <laughs> in the power. <laughs> yeah. And Gray McTavish is a Vice President of Power Canada for Stantec in Victoria. He's a civil engineer and power transmission specialist with extensive experience in engineering, uh, consulting, project management, and controls along with construction. His experience in utilities extends through Western Canada and into the United States prior to moving to Stantec. Graham was a VP for BC Operations for Valor, Valor uh, Construction and was responsible 
for the construction of large transmission line projects throughout British Columbia. So a, a, a good variety of uh, panelists and experts uh, to lead us uh, in the next um, talk. And each speaker will give them 10 minutes to uh, talk about their local story or their organizations and with a focus on community issues. So I'm not sure who's going to go first. Ran. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know after lunch, uh, even I'm trying to wake up, so I want to wake you, wake you guys up with a small joke. Uh, I was in Sandy Bay uh, three years back, and we had a really good uh, consultation uh, meeting going on uh, with our uh, you know, First Nation friends, and uh, there's someone stand up and said, hey, good to see Indian working for Indian. I said, who is the real Indian here? <laughs> I said, so let's have that debate for later. Let's uh, focus on the presentation, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Chief Elder uh, uh, Maureen for the prayers today morning. I had a privilege to know him through Peter Ballantin Cree Nation Negotiations, uh, Tinigi, for the prayers. I really appreciated it. And thanks to my colleague and uh, friend, uh, Professor uh, Pelzer, for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful symposium, and uh, I'm happy, thanks to my CEO, for taking the time and uh, supporting this kind of initiative. It's very important for SAS Power. And uh, from uh, here, you can see from this uh, picture, like uh, Elder Morin mentioned about, you know, like, uh, like uh, Peter Ballant and Cree Nation members were working on their transmission line cutting. So that's a perfect example of what indigenous uh, community and members can do for uh, uh, Saskatchewan and SAS power. So that's what I want to put the picture in, showing that, you know, there is a lot of opportunities for uh, indigenous uh, communities and business arms in Saskatchewan. So going into that uh, presentation, what happened? Did it screw it up? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yes. And um, thanks. So uh, like we talked about business cases here, right? So you can see some of those. Uh, these are the big buzzwords. Everybody's talking about renew renewable energy creates uh, uh, job growth. Uh, energy independence, and uh, you know, there is a attracts big money. When I did some research, there is almost like uh, 287.5 billion uh, in 2016 was invested in uh, renewable energy across the globe. And also, we talked about a lot of panels today morning. It was very interesting panel discussions. We talked about a lot of technologies, uh, interesting points about how uh, renewable energy is in big demand. It's going to be in big demand in the future. But when it comes to indigenous business development, so okay, thank you, Megan. Um, I just uh, picked up this uh, graph from uh, Bloomberg. So you see the 2016 investment, it's lots of billions of dollars. So uh, uh, anyone can think how much of this even 0.001% of it invested in indigenous communities. I don't think not much. You can see there's a lot of money invested in uh, renewables. But when it comes to indigenous development, it's not only Canada has an uh, indigenous uh, population, Aboriginal population where uh, I'm from India, Brazil, Australia. So there's lots of investments happening. So the most important thing when you develop the renewable energy is, uh, for example, SAS Power, thanks to our executive team, is we come up with a policy. Uh, it's a very dedicated policy for uh, Aboriginal procurement. So how many companies here has a dedicated policy here? Can you anyone raise the hands here, please? One, that's a good sign. So it looks like it's a pretty infancy state, right? When you want to have a dedicated uh, uh, Aboriginal procurement policy. So for example, SAS Power, we have a dedicated Aboriginal procurement policy. So I think uh, CCAB, Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business, they mentioned we are the first company in Crown Sector in Saskatchewan to have a dedicated Aboriginal procurement policy. So you can see we give a weighted uh, 
uh, like extra five points in every RFP goes out in the market for renewables, for services, so each and everything. What it does is it creates the you know, opportunity for uh, Aboriginal businesses and the communities to take part in our uh, supply chain. That's a very important. When we talk about renewables, and um, our CEO mentioned and uh, Raman mentioned, the 50% of the renewables, like 50% of our uh, generation is going to come from renewables in the next 15 years. That's a pretty ambitious target. So what we thought as a company, how can we make sure that we get enough involvement from Aboriginal businesses and communities? So one way of doing that is having a dedicated policy and with some extra points where there is the opportunity for uh, Aboriginal businesses and also non-businesses to compete. So I will show you some of the numbers, how it uh, helped some of the new economy in Saskatchewan with our policy. So what we have done with that uh, policy is uh, we started putting some uh, languages, which is kind of like a mandatory for the companies to come up with the Aboriginal in uh, labor participation and also the ownership structure. So basically, we are, we are making sure and forcing the supply chain to have some Aboriginal content. So we all talk about the renewables. Without a policy, it's very hard to get renewable projects going. And also, there's a lot of money is going to be invested. So how we can make sure that everybody gets the opportunities, especially from Aboriginal communities, and the vendors participate in the supply chain. So you can see some of the specific languages we have, as we said, uh, especially in some of the brownfield hydro development projects in uh, northern Saskatchewan, we said 25% of the labor participation must come from the local communities. So what it does is it gives the opportunities for the local uh, communities, like especially northern communities, to take part in our supply chain activities. So what it does is it creates job opportunities, it creates the growth. So you have to be a little bit, think outside the box. As SAS Power, we are started doing it. And what it does is even from our suppliers, they are saying it helps them to give a very value-added services because they're getting a local uh, people working and they're saving money on LOAs, living out of, uh, living out of uh, cost allowances, and also they're uh, preparing a capacity in the northern community where they can bid more work with us and with the different companies. They no need to worry about the labor shortage because they can find opportunities with the local uh, communities where they can build that capacity together. So this policy really helped SAS Power to navigate in our brownfield, and also we have this uh, language in our uh, greenfield developments. Like you see our uh, solar RFPs and wind RFPs, you will see those languages. So the uh, whoever bits into that uh, our RFP, they have to come up with the proper strategy, they have to do a proper consultation with the indigenous communities to bring that, their renewable energy bid to us. So it's a very good uh, opportunity for both sides. It's kind of like a mutually beneficial. And um, I just want to talk about these numbers quickly. So we had a target of 2.5% uh, of our capital spend, like Saskatchewan capital spend, focused towards just uh, Aboriginal procurement. So last year, we hit almost 7.9%. And um, the, actually, as a company in SAS Power, like our operating business units and uh, executives and the directors and managers and engineers, they see this as a very valuable policy because they're able to get local people doing the local work, it doesn't matter whether in a greenfield development or brownfield development, or services, or line cutting, everything. So we are having a lot of value added work coming from our local communities. So that's a big win-win for us. And also you can see from the numbers, it's, it's kind of like a, I will say that the Aboriginal economy is an untapped economy for Canada, especially in Saskatchewan, that's a new economy. So if whatever, as a company we are developing, we have a policy which where we can use this policy to work together with the local communities and to create the win-win opportunities. That's kind of like a kind of like a policy. You can see how policy drives the infrastructure development. It, it has to go mutually beneficial. So we have a policy which is strong, and also which is kind of like uh, how do you say that uh, we are the first company to do it. We do have a growing pain. And uh, definitely, but it's the right thing to do. 
And uh, again, a lot of people talked about today morning about capacity development. It's kind of like a chicken or egg thing. Whenever I meet with uh, indigenous businesses, they say, we, we don't have enough job to build a capacity. And SaaS power say, you don't have a capacity, so we can't give you a job. So end of the day, we have to come to the common ground in the middle. Let's work together. So we start identifying some projects where we are small, giving them uh, aboriginal entities to take on and build some capacity. So today morning, there's a lot of discussion about capacity. So it's very important, capacity development. So for SAS power, we are using this uh, one to do that. So by, by this one, I'm done with my presentation. And uh, thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyhow, uh, I'll take the questions in the end. Yeah. Try to make sure I understand how this works here. Capacity. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is um, actually an adaptation from Samuel Clemens. It says, you learn lessons carrying a wolverine by, around by the tail that you can learn in no other way. Uh, but I, I think something else happens, though. You learn how to wrestle wolverines, or you end up with a lot of yeah, bad marks. Um, so um, before I get into this, I just want to kind of, uh, I guess, share my thoughts so far from what I've heard, the great thing about going in the afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Uh, the thing I like about the afternoon is that I get a chance to see the other presentations and start to get the pace and the feel for what people are looking for and, and what we have to offer and share. Uh, I really appreciate, on behalf of the native village of EAC, the ancestral homeland, um, in Cordova, in the community of Cordova, the invitation to participate here. Um, of course, expecting to learn much more than, than I share, but um, I've tried to keep the presentation fairly simple and with some pictures, and there'll be actually examples, I think, to share some of the thoughts that I've collected so far. One is the technology panel this morning talked a lot about what I call hard technologies, uh, about uh, brick and mortar uh, infrastructure, things that we build, things that do things. But in listening to um, the first presentation this morning, Mira mentioned that one of her challenges in developing renewable energy um, projects in her villages is siting the project. That's kind of amazing when you think about it. Uh, this is a village that's going to benefit from the project, and just them deciding where to put it is one of the barriers. It's one of the challenges. I thought that was interesting. And then Ethan's example of uh, you know, really wind turbines are a mature te technology at this point. Uh, the construction's fairly straightforward. It has its challenges. But the, uh, the real challenge was getting the Federal Aviation Administration to do something they've never done before and allow some contractor to do that and bite off on it. That's a huge success. And that's just one little step in the progression. But those, those aren't hard technologies. Those are soft skills. Those are getting people and organizations to work together and do things they haven't done before towards a common purpose. And um, I think the soft technologies are where a lot of the challenges and, and a lot of the capacity building has to happen. Um, so Cordova, I'll share a different background than what I prepared. Uh, Cordova's had a lot of disasters, starting from a fairly successful indigenous culture that was um, you know, decimated and subjugated, uh, and then a series of external disasters, starting with um, the rise and fall of a huge uh, railroad mining empire that built a huge economy and then collapsed, something like uh, uh, is happening in Alaska now with our oil industry. Uh, and then a huge razor clam industry that was a world leading industry that grew up over the next couple decades, then was decimated by a 1964 earthquake that raised all the ground eight feet and decimated the clam beds. Then a huge salmon industry that built into uh, a world-class uh, fishery, year-round fishery, that was pretty much devastated by the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, these are all external disasters, and I think it did kind of a unique thing to Cordova, uh, which is kind of a, a, a community of independent people. And, and when you're influenced by a lot of external disasters, I think it triggers a fight response rather than a flight response. And so it's a community that has dusted itself off and keeps 
reinventing itself not in a survival mode but in an, an, in a way that excels and so it's just been fascinating for me to live there and participate in that it's what attracted me to the community in the first place it was a tremendous vision and um in execution by this unlikely out of the way place so um hard versus soft technologies and then um innovation uh I think is born in the Arctic. I think innovation is born of lean resources and need. And uh, that's where you have to use what you have available and you have to use it in ways that they haven't been used before. So I don't think the Arctic is a testing ground for innovation. I think it's the birthplace of innovation. And I think we need to find our way back to some of the innovation that had things like, just at lunchtime we were talking, a seal oil lamp was a combined heat and light resource. And now we're just starting to rethink um, using one piece of infrastructure to deliver several value streams. Um, academia, and uh, this is just a couple observations, academia and the utility industry both have something in common. Uh, we're mature monopolies, and maybe a couple of the la last uh, left standing. And um, that means we have tremendous, we marshal tremendous resources and skills and uh, financial uh, capabilities but it also makes us fragile because we're being disrupted by forces outside this room. I, I would argue that the electric utility industry's uh, threat isn't independent power producers, it's independent power consumers. They're the ones who are gonna make the choices. And the business in this world is being driven by the consumer. This is the golden age of the consumer and other industries have learned that you don't push resources towards the market, you pull the need from the consumer basis. We, haven't, we don't think like that yet because we're monopolies. Everything I heard this morning in the technology panel is how can we more efficiently push our resource out? And that would, an analogy would be a book publisher saying, we're gonna wait until a thousand people um, decide to order our books and then we'll publish a thousand and sell them and that would just be incredibly efficient. Instead of saying, let's just take orders and when we have five or 6,000 orders, we'll print 10,000 and sell the first five or six and then so forth. So um, smart grid I don't think is gonna be a matter of producing power more efficiently. I think the value there lies in uh, utilizing it more efficiently and giving the consumers the very simple and straightforward, in fact, behind the curtains opportunity for them to utilize energy more efficiently, create pull from electrical devices that can use the renewable energy when it's available instead of trying to hammer nature into a storage mechanism. So, um, ah, uh, Chief uh, Thomas, um, it all boils down to economics, but economics is really just value exchange, right? That's a universal currency that we use to exchange things of value. And uh, that's really what we're trying to do is add value and exchange value and uh, to promote, um, you know, uh, peace, I guess, uh, to have a, high, a consistently high quality of life and, uh, you know, across the globe. So this is Main Street, Cordova. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Um, I love this picture. That's 100% LED lighting on Main Street because we have renewable projects that keep us 100% renewable and extra in the summer, but we have to use diesel uh, generation in the winter. Um, lighting is low-hanging fruit, so we're, we retrofitted 100% to renewable uh, energy lighting. You also notice there are no overhead power lines in our system. We're 100% underground power lines. Okay, so um, Cordova is remote, and it is an indigenous community, about 20% uh, native village of Iak, and um, we have a tremendous relationship with the tribe. Uh, the utility, electric utility does. And I wanted to mention that's another thing that uh, tribes and academia and utilities have in common is uh, we all have the long view, right? Electric utilities think in decades, terms of decades uh, uh, for infrastructure development and return on investment. Academia thinks in terms of gathering and preserving and extending knowledge over the, I guess, course of human history and certainly investing in individuals, life you know, lifetime. And, um, and then tribes, of course, think in terms of generations. So I think that's why uh, we as Electric Utility, our strongest partner by far, and, the, and I hope a strong partner to the tribes, is, um, is that we have the long view. And we think in terms of just value and not bottom line. 
Okay, so um, you've heard a little bit about a cooperative. A cooperative's business model is a little bit different. It's owned by the customers of the utility. It's governed by a locally elected board. Um, we measure our success in terms of how our community succeeds. Uh, it's a not-for-profit not business model. And um, I mentioned our planning horizon spans decades. And so we're, we're value-driven, not just uh, cost-driven or profit-driven. So we think in terms of how can we provide value to the community. And you have to know what that value is and what your community wants to get there. So every community has a diversity of needs public safety, energy and transportation, culture and recreation, education and training, public health. And um, one place where you all agree is that you basically want to have a, a common social good, a sense of community. You want to have a sustainability. Every organization is trying to sustain itself. And you all want to have a decent quality of life where you live and work. So Power Creek, our Power Creek hydroelectric project is something that drug me through this thought process. Uh, and it's a project that we renew, that we developed with the perspective of a utility. How can we uh, meet the big three? The uh, provide reliable power, provide low cost power, and provide abundant power. And that's how we started out, but then all these other value streams kind of happened. Again, in a lean resource environment, we had to have partners to develop it. And uh, the tribe was right there at the same place as a utility. Uh, we were basically bankrupt as a utility and the tribe was almost ba bankrupt. So we were forced to work together. We'd been at bitter odds on other uh, things. And, uh, and the project really elevated both organizations. So the project is sited on tribal lands and then we leased that land from the tribe. So that created a huge revenue stream for the tribe. They were able to take that to the bank and uh, finance their 8A organization. And they're over $35 million in equity now. And the electric utility now has over $35 million in equity for our members. So we've really taken both organizations from the brink to a, a whole new place. So um, ultimately, Power Creek um, delivered a whole bunch of value streams. Because we made such a huge investment of $24 million in that project, we thought, what are all the ways that this can benefit the community? And frankly, there was quite a bit of criticism in the community. And uh, so we take our high school groups for tours of the power plant. You know, we're always saying, how can we get kids more involved in energy? Well, here's, a, here's an idea. Take them out to your project and let them see that that's uh, you know, producing all their community's power in a, in a way that they can make a physical connection. This water flowing out of the plant is making all your town's power right now. Then they get the physical sense of, okay, this is secure local energy that uh, you know, we have control over our destiny with. And um, recreational component, the, the access roads that we build, environmental groups often very uh, you know, oppose the uh, construction of new infrastructure and whatnot, but it's a great recreational resource. We keep the road plowed during the winter, and in the summer you'll see parents with strollers and you'll see hikers and everyone, so we added a recreational component to the, to the community. So what happens is you start deriving all these uh, value streams from one infrastructure investment, you swell your community's capacity that we're talking about. Um, you, uh, you start delivering value streams that you don't have to fund independently. You know, maybe if you have the recreational trail at your hydro project, the Forest Service or your local parks department doesn't have to build a trail. Uh, and so you start freeing up resources. So if you have your public safety and, and public health, for instance, there's no direct benefits of the energy project to those. But because you've freed up community resources, you can now invest and reallocate those resources to those organization, or organizations to have indirect benefits. So that's our thought process in developing energy projects. So the business case really boils down to Instead of looking at this as an energy project that we have to integrate into an energy system, how do we develop a community project that goes out and mines what are all the needs of the community and how can this project meet all of those needs? And it literally pulls in all your stakeholders, makes you communicate about how you're going uh, to derive the highest and best value out of that project. And that's what we're doing going forward in the development of this Crater Lake um, uh, project that we're working on. By design, we're adding the educational, recreational components to that project. So what I've done with these slides, and I think the slides will be shared, is I've annotated it so that um, I've kind of shared my thoughts on the bottom that explains the slide, and I think that will help. And I would encourage questions at the end. Thank you.
was working. Which one? Just the the power uh, cord. Good afternoon. I did realize on the weekend I made one fu fundamental fly of PowerPoints. I made it too long for too short a time. So um, I'll have to go through these pretty quickly um, once we get them up here. What I want to talk a bit about is not specifically um, remote communities, but where the grid and, and hole is going in North America. We're seeing substantial changes in the way grid is designed and used throughout North America. Um, we're seeing a different modernization of the power system. Uh, oh, first of all, I have to do our, who we are, Stantec. Um, so we're 22,000 company, 22,000 people uh, on the New York and uh, Toronto Stock Exchange. We have more 400 locations worldwide. Uh, we're prob uh, it depends who you talk to and what, what you read, but uh, third largest, um, Third largest consulting firm in North America and one of the largest water consulting firms in the world now. So, um, large company, My Power Group in Canada has about 500 people and we focus on renewables, um, both uh, solar, wind and battery storage projects. We also do a uh, substantial amount of T&D work for most of the utilities in Canada and we also do thermal and biomass generation. Uh, we have a separate group that does hydropower. So the grid, um, you know, this is the way most people know the grid. Uh, you've got large generation stations similar to SAS power. Uh, you have large transmission lines that, that transmit the power, um, and then you have drop-down substations that go to the distribution and all to your load sources. That's the way the grid has been designed over the years. But what we're seeing is a change. Um, where is it going? We're seeing more of this distributed energy, more of... Um, more smart cities and, and different types of focus on, on renewables and, um, and, and hydro and, and the controls to have a smart microgrid system. And why is that happening? Well, what we're finding, especially down in the East Coast and some of the Caribbean, we're seeing a difference. People want resiliency, they want sustainability, they want power now and they want it, uh, a stable power source. And what we're starting to see is they're going away from the, the, the traditional utility and going more towards what we see as more of a distributed energy. So what's driving it? Really, it's the emergence of microgrids. And, and I could probably talk to 10 different people in the room. Everyone will have a different definition of what a microgrid is. But really, it's a microgrid is, um, it's, a, it's a distributed generation. I think I got a... You know, it's a discrete energy system, distributed generation. It could either be connected to the grid or islanded to, to, all to itself. And a lot of microgrids will be designed that it can be tied to the grid to sell power or to buy power whenever they need, but it can also be islanded so it can be self-sufficient. So if there is a hurricane or a major storm, they can, they can be one amongst themselves. And we're starting to see it not just at a city level, but at a hospital level. The universities are starting to put microgrids in. We're starting to see it through small communities. We're seeing it in the Caribbean, trying to get from away from oil and more, more on the microgrid type solution. Um, you know, your, your a traditional backup di or diesel generation, we see it, you know, some of our uh, remote communities could be considered a microgrid. It's a standalone system that really manages the, the electricity needs of the community. So, but we're starting to see changes to microgrid to go more to multiple sources of, of a renewable power. Um, you know, we focus is now to, to lower the emitting uh, technologies and, and get technologies such as solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and thermal built into the grid. Uses and be benefits. Um, you know, it's, it's efficient. It's a mini version of a larger power grid all to itself. It's a smaller, localized form of generation, storage, and distribution. Um, it helps deliver lower costs, more reliable electricity, Storm resiliency, um, you know, if you're putting renewables, reduce pollution, um, community economic developments and jobs, and less, uh, you know, and, and um, a less effect on, on your ecosystem. Um, provides resilience in events of storms and provides the ability to grid congestion. Um, sorry, I went back one too many. So, configurations, and they come in all different forms, and I do like the speaker this morning who said, you know, 
If you've seen one remote community, you've seen one remote community. If you designed a, a microgrid for one remote community, it's not going to be the same for every remote community. You're going to have a different efficiencies of wind, different efficiencies of solar, different needs. Um, you know, you're still going to probably need some form of combined heat and power, some ba diesel backup, whether you use that, that heat for uh, heating your, uh, your school or for, for developing a greenhouse or whatever you may need that heat for, you still can use that heat off the diesel generation. But then you also have your renewables and energy storage. So you can use your, your, um, your solar and your wind turbines and hydro specifically if you have it with batteries to provide you more resiliency with your grid that you have. Sorry. So solar, you know, what we're seeing is a big change in the solar um, over the last 10 years. Um, you know, solar is an abundant energy source. Um, it provides some energy security. Um, you know, we're seeing lower long-term energy costs, uh, definitely a lower environmental footprint, GHGs and some of uh, the thermal generation, um, reduced harmful air pollution and, uh, you know, positive sustainability. So where's the market going? Um, we're seeing substantial increase in the solar PV market in North America. Um, solar energy now is, is running around 20%. Um, other renewable energy is, you know, that's what we're looking for in 2050. Right now, other renewable energy is 20%. We're seeing solar really um, non-existent when it compared to, you know, hydro and coal and other forms of thermal generation. But we are seeing a change right now. Um, Cansia is looking at, um, right now in, in 2017, we probably have about 3,000 megawatts of solar on the grid. They're forecasting to see over 7,000 megawatts in the Canadian market. Substantial increase. Um, we're working right now, we just finished two 50 megawatt projects in Ontario, and we have about four or five other large solar projects. And what's nice about the large projects, it's helping to bring down the cost of the solar panels and some of the construction costs. So what we're seeing um, is a huge change in the market. This is the US PV pricing. Um, in 2007, you were up around $8 a watt, six, six bucks for utility grade. Uh, 2017, we're now starting to see utility come down under $2 a watt. So that's almost a third of what we saw uh, in 2007. Uh, residential, of course, is still higher because it's, it's a smaller amount of, of construction, so you're going to see a higher cost. But still, it's come down from probably, you know, seven bucks down to almost 350, and we're still seeing with all the solar production, we're going to continue to see those costs come down over the next uh, four to five years as solar increases both here uh, and the U.S. We're starting to do some solar in, in Mexico right now, and we're starting to see lots of stuff in South America start to go. And then new applications. Um, I'm not sure any of those are going to be immediate, but you know we are starting to see a lot of uh, requests to build solar onto water, um, whether it's a, a, um, water treatment ponds or holding ponds for hydro, um, old tailing ponds for, uh, for mines. We're starting to see a lot of, of need for different technologies that we can use the land appropriately and sustainable. Tesla. Uh, we just did a, a test facility with Tesla in, uh, in Nova Scotia using the test panels for some industrial facilities as well as tying in back to the grid and looking how those Tesla panels affect the grid as they store power and, and move it in and out of the grid. So, you know, there's a lot going on uh, right now in the industry, a lot of new technologies. And with that new technologies, we're seeing the cost come down. We're starting to see the benefits of that that we can now start using to start building some of these technologies into remote communities. Oops, sorry. Battery storage is another uh, aspect. Uh, we're, we've built uh, two battery storage projects in, in Canada. Um, we've got uh, a few more on the books right now that we're starting early design on. This uh, technology um, is really starting to uh, have a big effect um, on the utility industry, especially the distribution side. Um, and a lot of the storage that's being used right now isn't for storage of power, but it's really to be used to, to make the system stable for frequency and voltage control, and, and as well as storage and using for peak power. We're seeing places like Ontario, 
uh, BC and Alberta starting to do it with a peak demand and they get charged at certain times a day. They're using storage to actually minimize that peak so they can actually minimize their costs and where that's going. But that again is helping as more storage is putting into North America, we're starting to see the battery prices come down substantially and we'll start to see this be much, become more economically benefit for stuff like um, the smaller scale uh, remote communities. I've been told I've got to hurry up. So. so again, energy storage balances load against generation, provides uh, ancillary services to the grid operator with frequency voltage support, uh, supports the grid in weak areas. So if you know, the line goes down, you can provide some, some time when the, the storage can use to, for the power requirements, and it provides peak shaving in those areas for, for load profiles and associated energy costs. So solar, PV, and wind and battery storage, um, you know, together, they allow peak saving, load balancing, grid support, diversity of supply, and ensures local reliable power for communities, campuses, and buildings. And again, we're seeing that starting to be done in the Caribbean. We've worked on a couple of projects that have all three together. We're starting to see some remote communities start to look at these as an option. And tying them all together provides resilient power for you at all times. And again, what are these benefits for renewable energy remote communities? Well, increased system resi resiliency, um, you know, primary source of fuel has been diesel. It's expensive, has high emissions, disruptive generators. Um, so we've seen high variable costs and therefore high electric prices that can deter economic advancements. And these microgrids can incorporate hydro, solar, wind to reduce or eliminate these diesel uses. And I'll final finish up with, you know, environmental risks and high costs of diesel combined with continuing cost reductions in solar, wind, and energy is providing the opportunity for affordable, renewable energy alternatives in remote communities. And I think that's it. So, thank you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Rand, Clay, and Graham. Uh, had to keep them on task. Uh, uh, the only reason is I want to make sure that there's enough questions uh, uh, for the, the audience uh, on this project. I was telling Gary um, that, uh, Clay, I'm, I'm not sure who your father is, but you look like, exactly like a young Doug Richardson. And for, <laughs> for those of <laughs> that know Doug and... He's old enough to be your father. <laughs> so was there any questions um, from, the, um, from the audience? Uh, I know the one, uh, I know we, uh, we talked a lot about the challenges uh, about um, microgrids and, and making sure on, uh, but one of the things uh, uh, I was thinking about is it was the advantages of microgrids. Uh, when you have 92 utilities as opposed to one utilities, if one of them goes down, well, you still have 91 others that are still up. And that's something that uh, uh, we learned uh, with ice storms and it's something we learned in Saskatchewan uh, when uh, um, it's whole towns that go out. It's not just a neighbor. It's not, uh, so that's, that's one of the big advantage, I think, as we move to uh, um, the microgrid uh, and to individual uh, solar houses is that just because mine goes down, I can go to my neighbors and watch the, uh, watch the riders. So, uh, yeah. Rick, question? Hi, Rick Richardson, Green Lake. No, you don't look like a Richardson. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, my wife wants to know from Stantec uh, where we can get one of those solar-powered moose. <laughs> but uh, I do have a question for uh, SAS Power, and that is um, uh, since there uh, seemed to be a, a need for policy and political change in order to uh, uh, allow for uh, business uh, uh, cases to be made for renewable energy. I know in our community we're on a net metering program, which restricts us to uh, limiting the amount of power that we can generate off of one billing unit, which is uh, our community hall in our case. Uh, but it, it doesn't maximize the use of the amount of space available for putting uh, photovoltaic panels on. So we have, um, you know, that is why we chose to put in 96 solar panels on that facility instead of 100 or 
its capacity, which would be closer to 350. Is there, to your knowledge, any plans on changing the, the ceiling limits that restrict um, the uh, development of solar initiatives in, in, and renewable energies to um, allow for a better business case to be made? And I include that um, uh, for a small energy producer program, uh, there's a ceiling on that of 100 kilowatt. And uh, the whole point, in my understanding, of uh, putting in a solar project is you put in what you can afford and add to it. Well, ultimately, you're going to get to that 100 kilowatts in not very long. And then a uh, business case wouldn't really be able to be made for that unless you have, you know, 10 small corporations in a village, which is also impractical. Uh, are you aware of any changes that are going to be coming uh, with SAS Power and, and their uh, procurement policy for purchase of power. Now I understand and, and one of the reasons that my community chose this uh, option of going into renewable energy is we, we have power reliability issues as well. We're a very long ways from the source of power, which means it's a lot of lines that can go down and going through some pretty rugged territory, it's inevitable that lines go down we have um, generally no less than five power outages a month. And of course, that's very hard on equipment and everything else like that. So uh, there are a number of challenges, which I hope that um, will be the, the father of innovation by, um, by showing that we need um, to look at policy, we need to look at uh, um, distance from source. Um, the amount of voltage drop just coming from south of North Battleford to my community must be enormous. If you go even further up to Lalash, that's another 300 kilometers and more of power lines. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why I believe that we have to go into more renewable projects, but there are certain barriers that have been um, placed there. They're artificial. I believe they can be changed. But then the other challenge is that um, there are a number of subsidies being um, uh, paid into uh, non-renewable resources, whether it be coal, oil, or any of the other traditional sources of uh, power generation. Uh, would uh, there be any plans within SAS Power to incentivize renewable energy projects, even if it wasn't to the same level as the non-renewable resources. Lots of questions, thank you. <laughs> we do want that moose though. <laughs> I think that belongs to Graham. So any of, uh, thank you for a bunch of questions. Uh, basically, right now at SAS Power, uh, we are looking at uh, solar. We have a dedicated team uh, working on uh, solar, uh, uh, like a generation especially looking at the different models. I think Raman touched base today morning about some of the, um, the future uh, opportunities uh, we are looking at as a company. One of them is a community solar uh, project where community can produce, uh, like become a, like have their own, uh, uh, how do you say, come up with their own project where they can come up and there'll be like 20 megawatts of community-based uh, solar projects, um, uh, like opportunities will be coming up. But you're talking about the small power producers, right? You're talking about 100 kilowatts. Why it's not more than 100 kilowatts? It's again, it's a system. We are looking at the design and the optimization of the, the production systems and stuff. You mentioned about uh, quite a bit of voltage drops and stuff. So it's very important. Like one of the things I wanna uh, make sure People say renewables is gonna be the future, it is. But also from our grid standpoint, so when you put anything into the system, we wanna make sure we have a reliable grid. That's a very important aspect of uh, being a power company is, so our guys are available 24 seven, make sure the lights are still on, right? So when you put any new system, we wanna make sure it's reliable and it's also compactable with our grid because we are the only backup power right now. A lot of people talk about microgrid, it's great, but in minus 40, if nothing works, you have to rely on something where SAS power is the most reliable company where we can provide that power. So whatever we want to do, we want to make sure the people want to put their own system, still they make sure they rely on us. If they don't want to rely on SAS power, then you are on your own. If something happens, 
then you don't have any other backup. So it's the being connected to the grid is very important. On the same time, having a renewable energy to offset your cost is also important. So it's kind of like a mutual. There is no right answer here. As uh, for SAS Power, we are looking at all these uh, opportunities. And also there is some uh, policy developments internally happening. And there is a dedicated team for uh, solar. They are looking at all these options uh, you talked about right now in the company. Thank you, Ryan. Any other questions? I know over lunch I had uh, lunch with Ian, Terry, and uh, Matt, uh, three engineers, and we did uh, solve all the world's problems on renewables, housing, and water. And uh, I think next time uh, a few cases of beer will probably solve every, every problem under the sun. Hi, uh, Chris Wharton from AMEC Foster Wheeler. Um, probably a question for Clay. Uh, we're in the business here in Saskatoon of developing and executing large projects. The soft skills that you talked about, and when you're developing a project, it's the, the bean counters of the people who are obviously trying to justify the project to. How did you um, execute your project whereby you are sort of um, the soft dollars these uh, all these the advantages of the projects to the social community. How did you justify a project in dollar terms when you are using the soft side of the just of the project? Clay. Well, if you um, if you bring in enough partners on the project, I mean those value streams are going to not only share in the benefits, but they're going to share in the cost, right? So if you have to uh, have a, an emergency power supply for your hospital. Uh, that has to meet certain codes and criteria, and you're going to add grid scale energy storage to your community, uh, why not site that battery at your local community hospital and replace their 30-year-old standby diesel generators with a battery? And then if that battery can also uh, replace um, spinning reserve that you're using renewables to provide, you've just expanded your renewable capacity by the amount that that battery is. So now you've got several different economic and social value streams that, uh, that are contributing, can contribute economically to the project. Mm -hmm. So uh, our Crater Lake project that I was mentioning, it was actually the city pursuing an expanded community water supply to meet the growing, the growing needs of the uh, fishing community, our, our industry. Uh, that said, hey, wait a second, this, is, this could be 10% of our renewable energy, uh, and wait a minute, we can also add educational, recreational components, um, even commercial components. Uh, one of the things I love about Reykjavik is the Pearl restaurant sitting on top of five municipal water tanks. <laughs> they're co-locating, they're sharing cost and benefits, and you, know, I, you could argue improving the skyline and doing all kinds of things. Uh, so they actually have a, that's, that's a great uh, private-public partnership. Right. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh -huh. But uh, very specifically, and this is part of the grant writing piece, I guess, you have to know what success looks like to everybody. So uh, when we went to the Native Corporation, uh, the EAC Corporation, the landowner, and said, hey, we want to develop this project, they saw a value stream, but we went to the federal government and said, here's, here's the value proposition. And uh, ultimately, we got $12 million from the federal government through the um, Indian Energy Act. And it did great things for the tribe and for the community at large. But the other half of the funding came from the state of Alaska. And we said, hey, we have a growing fishing industry here. We have lots of economic opportunities. And every dollar worth of fish that comes across the dock, you get 1.5% tax revenues. And it turned out that the, all the fish processing that came on shore uh, took the average uh, sales or the average uh, raw fish tax revenues to the state of Alaska from five million dollars or from five hundred thousand dollars a year to a million and a half dollars a year. So they started getting a direct measurable return on investment, and you have to show them that, and uh, so that they understand the you know the economic value to them. So that's and it just takes time to have those conversations and see where those value streams reside and. Um, and, and then follow the progress of the project direct and communicate those successes back. And then you're likely to get more funding for your next project. Yeah. Any other questions? Kevin? Hi, thank you. Uh, Kevin Hudson, Saskatoon Light and Power. Um, this question will be for Graham. Um, just wondering, in, in your experience across Canada, how, how have you seen utilities 
uh, set prices for different types of renewable technologies. For So for example, feed-in tariff in Ontario for solar compared to an open pool in Alberta, that kind of thing. Well, it's changed, it's changed significantly in Ontario. Um, five, ten years ago, they had the FIT program, which was fairly high prices on renewables. Now they're actually in an open market where you actually bid into a tariff and get your PPA. So that's uh, LRP1 right now is going on. Uh, and, and we've seen the cost drop sub substantially from what we saw on the FIT program to there. Um, in Alberta right now, they still haven't developed their, their, how they're going to market that, uh, the power yet. I, on the community de on solar side, uh, they do have, they're looking at 400 megawatts of wind right now. Um, and then in BC, you know, they went out for the PPA. Uh, Mike, you could probably help me better, but I think 2002 uh, developed a renewable portfolio. And then now they have a standing offer program, which up to 15 megawatts, you can put in up to 15, but you have to apply. And every year they have three or four projects that get selected based on the PPA for those 15 megawatts. We're starting to see some changes in, in Atlanta, Canada, as they're starting to get rid of their, their oil fleet and they're looking at options for, for wind and solar. But right now, I, there's really not uh, a substantial amount of, of, of wind and solar being developed in the Atlantic side. Um, and then Manitoba has a community development. I think they have some solar, but it's small solar. I think one just got put in for about, a, I think it was less than 100 kilowatts that they put in on one farm. Um, for their, uh, for their cattle, but that's, that was pretty much the only solar they've got. Um, so yeah, it's, but they're still seeing some in, in the Ontario market. The two we're working on are part of LRP1, and uh, those are two 50 megawatt units that, um, that are being put into the power, uh, they were bid into the power call and they, they won those. Right. Thank you. We still have a couple of minutes. Just want to make a comment in terms of uh, stability, in terms of ec uh, the economics. Uh, power is really important to that. And I know that uh, a while back, I was asking our uh, environmental health officers, they're sending out some boil water advisories. And I asked, well, is there something wrong with our, our systems and, and our operators? And they said, well, it's not that. It's every time there's a power outage, you have to uh, uh, issue a precautionary boil water advisory. So these are some of the things that affect northern communities, I think, more than uh, um, we have in the south. Uh, even though we have them in the south, you, multi you, have a, you had to have a, a multiplier to those. And this is a, these are the quality, quality of life issues that our northern friends um, deal with every day. And that's something that, you know, as we build these, uh, uh, these systems, that's why they're important to have their feedback and important that the, the projects meet the lifestyle that's in, in that community. And like, like each one said, each, each of those uh, communities are different and there's gotta be some uh, flexibility in whatever programs that we have uh, as we move forward and particularly uh, uh, for uh, a, a jurisdiction that has only one utility. So those things have to be built in, I think, uh, as we move forward. If there's no other questions, I'm gonna ask um, and thank uh, our panelists for this afternoon's um, discussion and uh, very informative, at least for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.